Now, adventures in commercialization here on Think Tech uh, on a given hmm, Tuesday. And uh, I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and that's uh, Zoe Heaney. And she joins us. Why? Because we're introducing her to you. Uh, and we're going to talk about her new show, which is called, ready, Adventures in Commercialization. Uh, good afternoon, I should say, Zoe, because you're on the East Coast. Where are you, Zoe? Currently, I am in Lexington, South Carolina for the holidays. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> um, South Carolina has got special political meaning these days. <laughs> I hope I hope this uh, everything is you know peaceful in South Carolina in the in the holiday season. Um, so let me ask you, um, why are you interested in commercialization? Uh, how does it comport with your life up to this point? And where do you see you taking commercialization in your life after this point? Yes, yeah, so I have been blessed to have the opportunity to work for one of the largest angel investment networks in the world. Um, if you've ever seen Shark Tank, very similar to that. Uh, we brought seven new companies. Instead of 350 sharks, uh, instead of the six sharks, we had 350 sharks. And we would bring seven new startup companies a month to five different cities to present to these 350 sharks and really um, try to facilitate and uh, syndicate some investments for some of these startup companies. These companies were anything from a kitty litter to a cancer research, um, doing some great things out in the world and even in these hard times with COVID, uh, still trying to raise money for some, for some really great causes. So um, watching some of these companies do their pitches and uh, you know get their go-to-market strategies and try to commercialize themselves was just something that really sparked my interest and and as an event coordinator, it's now had me tap into different industries of, you know, medical devices, uh, cancer research or research um, drugs, and then on to other smaller uh, go to market strategies, such as, um, you know, things that you could potentially see in Target, like the women's Clarisonic face brush, the little electric brush that most women have in their in their uh in their utility bags. So um, yeah, I just, it's something that's been really close to my heart and watching a lot of these companies grow and become just amazing causes has had me want to tap into them even further. Oh, are you, are you going to bring your checkbook like those guys do? <laughs> are, are you going to make proposals to them about your funding and investment and stock interests and so forth? Uh, I mean, it's definitely something we can talk about. I'd love to be one of the angel investors in the room or, um, you know, accredited investors one day. At this point in time, my, my position was to be the liaison and connect people with the money with the people who need the money. So <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, that, that offers the possibility that you would not only bring people um, on your show who are startups, um, entrepreneurs, whatever. Um, but you would also bring people on your show who do have checkbooks. Is this something you contemplate? Yes, yes, no. I already have a list of, uh, of great investors who would love to come on the show and talk about what they look for when they're looking for uh, companies and for exiting those companies and really taking them to the next level. Clarisonic Face Brush was one just small example of a very small startup company that came through our forums. They uh, were actually uh, got some investment and then later sold to Target. So exited later to Target. So that commercialization of that product. And I don't know a woman now in today's world that doesn't have one in their bathroom closet. So <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know even what it was myself. But hey, that's just me. <laughs> so how, how would you differ from Shark Tank? For example, it always strikes me on Shark Tank. Um, I get different people see this differently, but uh, of how often embarrassing it is for for the fellow who's doing the pitch um, and how those guys are merciless in the way they you know strip down his his idea and his company um, it's embarrassing are, are you gonna do the same thing or are you gonna be more kindly um, I think that constructive criticism is great for everybody um, in some of our forums that we've had there's there's been some you know, peeling back of the layers of some of the companies and, and looking at some of the holes that are happening in their in their plans and their due diligence. Um, something that makes 
the angel investment networks a little bit uh, more, let's say handholding for these entrepreneurs is uh, that, First of all, they're they're voted into the organization. So these those watch pitches and they're kind of looking at these these entrepreneurs to see what they think the rest of the group is going to invest in. So it's really kind of a pre-screening process that happens for them. And then along the way, uh, the investors will actually get into a committee and do a due diligence on the company. So then they get full access to the company and start deep diving. They'll actually go firsthand and look at the facilities and see what's going on and then almost mentor them into getting to that next step. So I think, and a lot of time the company Companies that we're looking at on the angel level aren't all the way at the you know getting into stores level and sometimes don't even want to follow it through that far they want to go they want to exit you know give that headache to somebody else once I've made my money and let's move on to the next cool project mm -hmm. so it's really interesting to learn that um, people don't really hold on to some of those companies to the end to the point where we see them in stores. Mm -hmm. The sooner you can go for um, what do you call it a liquidation event? That's not the right term. Um, <laughs> the sooner you can get out, the better. An exit, right? an exit and strategy, you know? Exactly. And then you have shares in it, and then you just watch it grow and make money and go on your uh, your yacht vacation at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. Unfortunately, we're a nonprofit. That doesn't happen with us. So um what 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 are the what are the points of interest that you would cover with somebody who had an idea, was pitching you the idea? um you know want to get some investment capital going um what are you looking for and what are you trying to avoid hmm, great question so some of the things that we're looking for is a strong a board. We really want to have some people in your back pocket that have either done this before and that are kind of mentoring you. And so having a great team and a great CEO and a COO are, are usually the first things that you want to look for. People, when you're investing, when you're an investor and you're trying to invest in some of these companies, you're not only handing over a check, like you also are are investing in that, those people. And so um, looking for a really great team and great board of mentorship is, is always the first thing I think that they look at. Um, do they have their own skin in the game? Are they, are they putting their own money in and not just taking no salary for a year? I mean, that's not enough for, for some of these investors. They wanna know that you're putting your own money into it as well. Like if you're not gonna put money into your own company, how can you ask these investors to put some of their money in? So those are, I think those are the two top, the top ones that I've heard that people are looking for um, and things we're not looking for. Um, I think that just really depends. A lot of companies that are just trying to do a consumer product can be very difficult, um, you know, producing those items, especially now in the time of COVID. Um, yes. And then research. Research is really hard as well. Um, not, and because research can get a lot of funding and, and not go very far sometimes. So, um, but I have seen some really amazing cancer research companies that, um, you know, are, are amazing and that do get funding, but they, I think that investors do get a little bit more weary when it's more of research phase or mass production, because that takes a lot of money. Mass production. Sure. Um, and especially in our time mm -hmm. when, um, you have supply line issues. And I'm, I'm sure that to me, one of the fundamental threshold questions is, are you sure you can get the pieces? Uh -huh. Because if you can't get the chips, um, if you can't get the, you know, the, the elements, the compounds that you need, um, don't even start. Uh, for example, there was an article in the New York Times uh, yesterday and in the Washington Post about cobalt coming out of the Congo seems like the Chinese have cornered the market, the global market in cobalt, which is essential for batteries. Mm -hmm. So if somebody came to me and said, uh, yeah, we're going to build this new battery. Uh, my first question would be, um, hmm, you're going to use cobalt? Because cobalt is a critical element. And um, they said, yes, I would want to know how. <laughs> they want to get cobalt and, and whether the price is, um, you know, at a price they can predict or whether it's uh, whatever the Chinese market will bear, <laughs> which may not be what they can afford or, you know, put in their budget as a problem. 
Yeah, so manufacturing is, uh, you know, I mean, is, is manufacturing something you would favor conceptually, sort of on a, uh, a national interest basis, you know, like, you know, the administration after administration says to us, we have to get back to manufacturing. Uh, we have to make this a manufacturing com com country again, the way it was. And, and although that, that may not prove out to be profitable all the time, and as you said, there are greater risks, especially now, um, what about the national interest? What about impact investment? What about, for example, um, entering into, um, a, a, you know, supporting a company that was doing something for climate change uh, somehow, who knows how, um, and, you know, you're not sure if they can make it, but you want to do something for climate change. Uh, or on the other side of that, here's a company who wants to do fossil fuel um, no, that's not necessarily in the national interest or in the global interest for that matter. So where, where does impact investment, you know, fall in your analysis of a given applicant? I'm happy you asked. There, um, there was different committees for different types of investment. So, you know, there's medical device investment, technology investment, um, and anything, like I said, from kitty litter to cancer research, but we did have impact investing. And this is personally one of my favorite coming from um, a lot, a little bit of nonprofit background myself. And impact investing doesn't necessarily have to be a nonprofit. It's going to be a company like you mentioned that is in it for some money, but then also has an impact on either, you know, the earth the environment or society as a whole. And so when we look at some of those companies, we do look at them a little bit differently. However, you have to remember in the back of your mind, they are still profit having companies. Like they are still out there trying to create a dollar. And so they are still considered you know, a public entity of, of investment, but they do have that little niche of, of, of environmental or or you know impact so some of the companies and one that i actually really would love to bring on this show is uh, a company that sends salmon over the dams um, one just for the reproduction two for um, their our ability to have them commercially and then also to feed orcas and help the whole ecosystem um how do they make money like, where is this money coming from? Like, how did they commercialize this type of a business? I, it's, it's amazing to me, but uh, how, how they came up with this idea, but where did that seed start from? And how, how are they making this work? How are they continuing to getting funding? Is it going to be governmentally funded? Is this privately funded? Um, what got them, you know, their commercialization into this product? And so that's, that's one company um, we love to look at uh, colleges. I mean, uh, there's a lot of company colleges that have robotics programs that do really fun new products or um, water stations for workplaces that all, you know, give you a little bit of oxygen in your water and track your water intake in order to help society as a whole and get you a little bit healthier. So there's a lot of different companies that come through that have just a little bit of niche where they created a, a product and they're trying to get it out into the market, um, but it also for, to make money, but they also are doing some sort of good. So those, those are personally my favorite. Yeah, well, you know what that sounds like one of my theories is that we, we should never forget that the young people uh, soon enough are going to be the leaders of our country and globally. And um, we have to see them that way. We have to encourage them to do that. And we have to know when to turn over the reins to them. Um, and, you know, part of it is, uh, can they be leaders within their own companies? So the people you talk to today are the leaders tomorrow, not necessarily political, although that's possible, um, but certainly in business. And frankly, business where is where everything happens. Business is where real leadership surfaces, uh, because you always know you always know the agenda of the individuals involved, and it's usually to make money but also impact investment. So I wanted to ask you about, um, I wanted to ask you about um, technology in the software sense. Where does that fit? You know, we haven't really talked about that yet today. Um, where does that fit? Is that a high priority? Do you think that's something you would focus on? Is that something we need? Um, is it something that is mm, more likely profitable than other things? 
software itself. I mean, right now with our day and age and how we are working, even how we're talking right now, um, there's a lot more software and programs and platforms that need to be created just to make our lives a little bit easier for um, just our daily lives today. Um, I know that we've had a lot of platforms and software that um, has made our lives easier, but it's still a learning process. We are still trying to maneuver this new age. And um, I've worked with companies such as Oracle. I've worked with Microsoft, Amazon, and just seeing how they're trying to innovate and uh, evolve into this. It's still, it's still a process. They haven't, nobody's mastered it yet. <laughs> no, and, and certainly things change, you know, there's one thing constant and that's change. And we are in a world now that changes faster than, you know, it did a decade ago. And, and I suppose one of the things that you have to consider is whether this company is going to be able this this applicant, so to speak, this 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 pitch person is going to be able to keep up with the change. Whether the idea, okay, is good enough uh -huh. um, to mm, respond to changes in our world, or whether it's going to be like you know the buggy whip. Was that, wasn't that it? The buggy whip, make a, a better buggy whip, but except there's no buggies. Uh, <laughs> so you've got to factor that in, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got to test the idea against what everyone thinks and that we don't know for sure. Uh, the changes are going to be. This is a very interesting kind of analysis that you'd be doing with some companies. You say, that's a great idea, but mm -hmm. that's like the buggy whip. Not going to work. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to bring a range of different groups in here, uh, entrepreneurs that have made it work, and ones that you know it did just didn't work out for them. Um, I do know a lot of projects who started to create platforms like a, the New Age Etsy, but only for woodworking or something like that for woodworkers in general, just very specific. And uh, you know, one his uh, pitch battle and uh, at his school um, was actually had a whole platform going and then you know just fizzled out didn't work out COVID hit and they just weren't able to make it or get funding to continue on but then I would also really like to look at other companies as you mentioned impact investing one just popped into my head which I did have on my list and hoping that we can get them on the show but um, we have a generator battery and basically their patent is that they can pull out when you get down a percentage you can pull that dead 25% out while it's still generating electricity um, also solar or powered or you know not but these then you can swap a new piece of the battery in and bring it back up to 100 percent. and they were looking at being used for concerts but also you know doomsday if you want to look at it like that um and trying to see these are solar powered and how they got their patent and how they're they're growing uh, significantly during this time um just to be able to help people who are stuck in their homes or uh, creating productions for more energy at home. Yeah, that reminds me, uh, you're, you're deeply uh, ensconced in energy. That's a good part of your background is energy. Can you talk about that? I mean, where do you want to go with energy? Because energy is really moving, um, like it or not, whether the government does what it says it's going to do, and I believe it will uh, or not, you know, there's a tremendous demand out there necessitated by various economic factors for energy, for cheap energy, renewable energy, okay. energy and batteries. Oh, you need cobalt for batteries. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about energy as an area uh, that you would inquire in? Yeah, so I currently am doing a contract. Um, I'm an event coordinator and project manager for Puget Sound Energy in Seattle, Washington. And I uh, manage all of the projects that have to do with energy efficiency for residential and commercial businesses. Uh, and then I also work with the renewable energy, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, the windmills and the solar panels that we're building on different uh, instead of somebody having to have one on their residence, they're going into local businesses, they're getting grants from the government to place them on a local school or boys and girls club, and then people can buy shares into it, making it a little bit less of a cost overall for people and more of like a monthly cost than a large $30,000 cost that goes on top of your house in Seattle, Washington, where it's not really that sunny all the time. Um, and then I also do electric cars. Um, I do a lot of project management for the electric car group. And uh, when talking about 
about batteries, that's a hot topic for the electric cars and electricity as a whole and how to manage that upon our grid and how people just manage it in their daily lives. Uh, you know, that's, we have a lot of events where we bring people who own EVs onto, you know, the camera and then also the people who are installing these locations to educate people about how it works and, and what that switch looks like. The, you know, uh, politicians have been trying to push uh, all year for this uh, gone to net zero by, you know, by 2030 or 2040. And, and I just, we gotta, we gotta look and see what that looks like and how, what kind of milestones they have to hit to actually make something like that happen. Yeah, a lot of, so much of it is, um, we wanna say public relations, uh, advertising, uh, trying to develop a pitch that's consistent, that's resonant with the, we want to call it the, the, the consumer and government environment, the, uh -huh. the expectations that have been expressed in the marketplace. Yeah, you know, the, this company, this hypothetical company has to be in tune with that. Well, you know, the other thing is, is, um, is, is, is intellectual property. You know, because if I, if I come before you and I have no intellectual property and an idea that can be knocked off by anybody anytime, that's one set of facts. If I have a even a, you know preliminary uh, pat patent uh, or utility patent, uh, I'm a lot I'm a lot better off, and I should be much more attractive to you. And now in Hawaii, we have an organization called the Office. Of, this is at the University of Hawaii Office of um, Technology Trade something, uh, and they help you getting patents, um, both the preliminary patent I forget the term for it and the utility patent. Um, and and in, in, in past years, they have actually funded um, getting the patent, which can be many tens of thousands. Um, so how does that play in your vetting you know, of these entrepreneurs? Um, that is, whether they have intellectual property, whether they need intellectual property but don't have it, and um, whether they have a way to fund it. Yes, so patents are a huge sector of our business. Um, making sure that you know you own you own your ideas is is so important. Um, but also sometimes getting a patent can take years. So um, you know we we sign NDAs daily. I mean, when we get these pitches, we'll have companies that come into the room because they know they're in that process and they know that the people in the room have more money and, and more resources to be able to access creating a product like that. I mean, I, I have done a prison project where we had entrepreneurs we had investors go and speak about entrepreneurship to incarcerated um, individuals so that they could start to to create the toaster masters were creating these programs where people would try to rehabilitate themselves and go out and create an idea and and become some you know their own employer because a lot of times it's hard to be uh, back into the workforce once you've been incarcerated and sometimes there's people who've been that will be in there for the rest of their lives and their ideas will will get created out there and they won't ever see a dollar of it so i've i've seen both sides of it um you know intellectual property and owning your ideas is is a it's a difficult, difficult path to get through. Um, but yeah, I think that when you have a plan and you and you protect your plan and you take all the precautions to be serious about it, then um, there's ways to, to get through um, not having a patent and still getting your idea across and still getting investment to get to that point. What, one of the most creative guys I ever knew invented a little gizmo for joggers, it was. And um, there's a, a little gizmo to help um, to help you carry things while you were jogging. It was creative. It was clever. And I said to him, you know, what about what about getting a, a patent on this thing? Some kind of intellectual property. And he said, I don't, I don't have the time or money for that. I know they're going to knock me off, but by the time they do, I'll be on to my next project. <laughs> I have a pipeline of projects and they're all clever, so I don't care. It's, it, I just mentioned this, it's kind of, it's kind of um, cute. And uh, he was quite successful doing exactly that. He kept on coming up with new ideas and they could, they could knock him off, but not quick enough for him to go to the next one. <laughs> 
See, that's a serial entrepreneur if I ever heard of one. You bet, you bet. And, <laughs> and that's what you're looking for, isn't it? It's a this guy is. who is, always has a new idea. Yep, and the I'll, honestly, some of the most uh, successful investors that I've met have bought and sold multiple companies. They, they've come in, they've found a great team, or they've walked in and been asked to become a CEO to take it to exit. And they are just constantly getting on the bandwagon and they, they see potential in something and they take them to the point where they're making, um, you know, big exits. So I, I think, I think that that's great. If we can all become a part of this community and share our knowledge, um, that's priceless. Yeah. There's a lot of issues that have, in my view, have held up the entrepreneurial experience. And as I say, the younger generation may come up with solutions for that and remove those roadblocks and have better collaborations, um, better flow of ideas, better flow of, of talented people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, for example, the, the non-compete provisions, which are in a, a number of the companies you mentioned, uh, really hold people back from new ideas. They hold people back from shifting jobs. They, um, it, it creates a, a bit of a limitation. And I think going forward, and you will probably see it in talking to some of these entrepreneurs. Um, they're they're going to try to invent new systems. But I wanted to ask you one other question, and that is the word commercialization. Um, the Office of Technology Transfer here at the university, their big thing was, uh, we'll help you with patents and intellectual property in order to commercialize. But there's much more to commercialization than that. Uh, what do you contemplate by using the word commercialization in the title of your series? Yes, so it's really taking an idea from a piece of paper and creating an actual product and getting it in front of people and getting it bought. Um, and, and that takes so many different steps, like pushing to commercialization is, uh, if we can even, I give multiple examples throughout the show, but um, one of our, uh, you talked about patents as being a barrier, that is a barrier to commercialization, of course. Um, but then also, if you look at medical companies, um, I know an amazing uh, company, uh, Odonexus, I'm hoping to get Caitlin Cameron on here. She's the most wonderful and professional woman I've ever seen in business and watching her over the years continue to request investment and go through different series of investment and rounds um, to get and she just got epic uh, FDA approved so that's a huge I mean that is a huge barrier to commercialization when it comes to the medical field and that's something that I'd really like to touch on with her um, because her product is just it, it doesn't, there's nothing like it out there. There's nothing to compete with it. And there's no reason why we shouldn't have it in our day-to-day -day lives just to make everything easier. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you too much more because I'd love to tell you more about it in a different show. But, uh, but just looking at like the different barriers to getting to the end point, to getting in front of people and, and being in the public eye is really um, the milestones it takes for commercialization. And that's what I really want to touch on here. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, this reminds me of uh, the entrepreneurial energy that was in Hawaii in the early 2000s. Um, you know, we had a tech industry uh, of sorts and we had people who talked just like you about um, commercializing things. Uh, since then, you know, we spent more time on hotels, and um, and I'm hoping that your discussions will will uh, invigorate uh, potential entrepreneurs here in Hawaii. Uh, what are your thoughts that. about that? I mean, are you limited geographically? No, I'm not. Um, as a as a child of the world, my parents both worked for the airline, so I'm blessed to be able to travel and and have been to Hawaii and and. Uh, almost every state, I think, except for the Dakotas. Um, so they're on the list. But um, I just think that in our new day and age and in these past couple of years, I, even me trying to do networking or, uh, sessions online, I mean, it's so difficult. And when you talk about software or platforms that need to be created to make it easier to not just do a breakout session and a Zoom call, but to be able to really have some sort of a networking aspect so that these, these 
entrepreneurs aren't discouraged. I don't, I don't, I want this show to potentially be a little spark of like, it is possible. You can still get in front of investors. You can still get out there. Like, don't, don't give up on that dream or um, don't, you know, there's still ways to commercialize. And honestly, today with this accessibility to people, they've been sitting in their homes for so long. So they might even have an extra space on their calendar to be able to do a quick zoom call with you. Don't even need to drive in traffic downtown or (laughs) be in the rain or have an accident or, you know, we're, we're taking away all those other barriers. So (laughs) if we can do that and we can, um, open this, this platform, um, to, to commercialization, then I think that we can find ways to to really help some of these companies get get that that. I'm angle. encouraged. I'm mm-hmm. encouraged, and I'm excited about your show, Zoe. And I look forward to uh, having it start, which will be in a couple of weeks, and uh, continue on a biweekly basis. And we're so looking forward. And I really appreciate the you know the thinking you've done to prepare for it, the rolodex you've built, and the experiences you've had. So this is going to be great, Zoe. I'm telling you now, you're going to actually incentivize <laughs> a lot of people by what you do. Awesome. Thank you so much. As we say, aloha, looking forward.